they were worried about people not trusting the press anymore and the danger that people might even reach a point where they don't trust their own ability to know what's going on, to understand the truth, in which case they might sort of just back off and watch as democratic institutions were dismantled. Welcome to Journalism History, a podcast that rips out the pages of your history books to re-examine the stories you thought you knew and the ones you were never told. I'm Terry Finneman, and I research media coverage of women in politics. And I'm Nick Hershon, and I research the history of New York sports media. And I'm Ken Ward, and I research the journalism history of the Great Plains and Rocky Mountains. And together, we're professional media historians guiding you through our own drafts of history. This episode is sponsored by Taylor & Francis, the publisher of our academic journal, Journalism History. Transcripts of the show are available online at journalism-history.org slash podcast. 2022 marks the 75-year anniversary of the final report composed by the Commission on Freedom of the Press. The report, titled A Free and Responsible Press, is now recognized by media historians as one of the landmarks of the 20th century American press. The report was released in 1947, after several years of work by that Commission on Freedom of the Press, often referred to as the Hutchins Commission after its chair, University of Chicago President Robert Hutchins. It identified a clear civic duty of the press, and it called on the news media to act responsibly, recognizing its importance to a well-functioning democracy. In this episode, I talk with Stephen Bates, an associate professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, who has done extensive research on the Hutchins Commission and the reception of its findings. Bates explains how the commission came to be and what it found before exploring the many ways its findings remain extremely relevant to journalism, even 75 years after they were released. Stephen, welcome to the show. So uh, help us understand a little bit about the origin of this commission, right? Why was this commission commissioned, and uh, when was all of this getting started? Uh, Henry Luce was the uh, co-founder and the editor of Time magazine, and he was uh, friends with a Yale classmate of his named Robert Maynard Hutchins, who uh, was president of the University of Chicago. And in the early 40s, uh, Luce talked to Hutchins about maybe getting together a uh, an organization, a committee, to reconsider freedom of the press. The university at the time was taking corporate money to do scientific research, and uh, Henry Luce said, why don't you take some time? Time Inc. money to do a philosophical uh, research project. Uh, Hutchins, the first few times, said he didn't think it was feasible. Finally, he said he'd be willing to give it a shot. And uh, in 1943, uh, Luce and Hutchins chose the members and began the first of the meetings was at the end of uh, 1943. The commission ended up being Hutchins uh, as the chair, and then 12 Americans, uh, among whom were some of the leading intellectuals of the day, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, Archibald. McLeish. Henry Luce came to the first meetings. He was never a member, but he came to some of the meetings and then was told they'd rather not have him there uh, because he was providing the money. Uh, Time Inc. ended up providing $200,000, and some of the members thought it might compromise their independence if he were a part of it. Sure. Now, uh, why, why Hutchins? Is it just because he was a friend with, uh, with Luce? Did he have any, like, journalistic uh, background? How, why, why is he the one who's, who's uh, tapped to lead this commission? I think a couple reasons. One is he was one of the most prominent public intellectuals of the era at a time when public intellectuals were pretty prominent. They really uh, mattered. He had been on the cover of uh, Time magazine, of Luce's uh, Time. He had written articles for all sorts of magazines. He was the best known educator uh, of the time as uh, head of the University of Chicago. He was a sort of wildly witty and outspoken figure who was quoted in the press about just about everything. Uh, When he was against American uh, involvement in World War II before Pearl Harbor, and he would give speeches uh, that were carried on nationwide radio networks. He was kind of a, a celebrity in this world. And among the topics that he had discussed was journalism and what he thought were its uh, flaws and shortcomings. So I think those are some of the factors behind it. Gotcha. What, what about those other folks on the commission? Were there journalists uh, among, among those who were tapped to, to help or, or sit in one of these seats on the commission? 
Luce thought it would be better not to have any journalists on the commission, and Hutchins uh, went along with that. They ended up getting Archibald MacLeish, who was the Librarian of Congress, and he was kind of a journalist. He had been one of the star writers of uh, Henry Luce's Fortune magazine during its first few years. Uh, but they thought there would be a kind of a purity to it if they didn't have journalists with their conflicts of interest. The other thing I think that's important is that the members of the Hutchins Commission thought of journalism as an educational field, as a teaching field. And almost all the members of the commission were professors or former professors themselves. And so they thought it was kind of similar to what they knew about. Okay. So so what, what sorts of questions were they exploring, right? If we have this commission on freedom of the press, obviously freedom of the press is going to be important, but how are they interpreting this? And like, what are they doing? What sort of work are they actually doing as a part of this commission? From the start, they knew that they were going to go beyond legal freedom, beyond sort of the scope of the First Amendment, and talk about responsibility and, and moral obligations as well. Uh, they were not terribly well organized. Uh, Henry Luce really never had a very clear idea of what he wanted. He kind of liked the idea of coming up with a question and then hiring a bunch of smart people. Uh, in this case, smart white men were the only people who were chosen and sending them off to do the work. It's a little odd when you think about it to try to get a committee together to answer a philosophical question. Um, that's a kind of audacious and, and maybe even a ludicrous idea. And, and Lou seemed to think maybe they'll come up with a new statement that will inspire people. Maybe there'll be something more analytical. Maybe it will have global implications. I don't know if he really knew. Hutchins was distracted and wasn't really on top of it. They decided not to do a great deal of research. Hutchins um, was uh, hostile, antagonistic toward social science in general and content analysis in particular. So he stymied various research proposals that came from one member, Harold Laswell. They did interview journalists and others. Uh, Hutchins liked to sort of pretend that it was a quasi-governmental body. So he referred to their deliberations and he referred to people appearing before them as witnesses. And they had uh, several dozen witnesses, including some journalists. But mostly what they did was sit around a table uh, in 17 meetings, most of them two or three days long, and talk. Uh, they exchanged uh, drafts of things, memos, papers. It, the commission produced several uh, supplementary books as well as their report. But mostly it was sitting around talking. And I found as I uh, looked through this, uh, the deliberations in some ways are more interesting than the report itself. To see these really smart uh, people working through some timeless problems. Uh, the commission hired a court reporter who transcribed uh, all of the meetings and the deliberations haven't been published, but they're really enlightening. Uh, they're fascinating. That's interesting. So, so give us a taste of what they found. What, what was the uh, outcome of all of this deliberation then? And what, what did the finished product look like? And, uh, yeah, did it did it speak toward the press in terms of journalism? Was it more broad than that? You said they were interested in other topics as well. So what did they find? They said they were looking at all different uh, media of uh, nonfiction as well as fiction. They said they were talking about movies. Uh, they were they did talk about radio and not just uh, radio news. But the report, um, when it was published in 1947, was really mostly about public affairs news in print, uh, even though they talked about these other things. Uh, that was its, its principal focus. They didn't talk a great deal about culture, uh, the media's impact on culture, apart from uh, the media's impact on politics. What they, uh, what they produced was a general report uh, called a free and responsible press uh, that's around 100 pages long and then several supplemental uh, volumes, two of them by commission members and then others by staff members. And uh, what, what did it contain? What were some of those main findings? Well, it's... Well, in some ways, the main findings are uh, may seem not terribly surprising now. They were kind of surprising and, and important in 1947. 
And it was important, I think, just that the group like this would come together and reach these conclusions. Uh, one is that the press is free for the sake of aiding democracy. Uh, and that it, to do so, it needs to provide information and a, a space for people to deliberate and understand. And they thought of, of the press as, as performing a kind of unifying function in the sense that its task is, is not just to inform the community, but also in some important way to form the community. Uh, they talked about free speech as being something bigger than the First Amendment. And the idea was that you can be using your legal First Amendment rights, but abusing free speech in some other sense. If you are, as a journalist, acting irresponsibly, or if you are, as, a, as an outsider, trying to suppress someone else's speech, trying to boycott, for instance, a newspaper because what it has said doesn't please you uh, or your organization. Um, they just they talked about democracy, diversity, the importance of truth in context as as important functions of the press, um, and and the idea that the press to serve democracy needs to defend democracy needs to be self conscious about it. One of the members, Harold Laswell, said the press can be objective between Republican and Democrat, but not between a democratic system and an authoritarian system, that there should be no shame in being biased in that sense. Uh, and then I guess the two big conclusions they reached were that the free market is not enough. Uh, the marketplace is not going to provide the incentives necessary to produce high quality journalism. Uh, but at the same time, there's not much of a role for government that for government to step in uh, with regulations would probably compromise the press's independence and cause more harm than good. They left an opening uh, for the government to step in if the press didn't uh, get better on its own. And they sort of threatened the press. They, they said that if the press doesn't improve on its own, regulation is, is inevitable. And, and we think in a way it's too bad, but it's inevitable. The First Amendment will be pr no protection. Uh, the First Amendment will be amended, they said. So they're kind of saying, we're on your side, press. We want to save your freedom. You have to do better or else you're going to lose your freedom. And here's how you can do better. Interesting. Now, were, were those new ideas at the time or were they simply kind of uh, formalizing ideas that were, were common? And if so, who were they common among? Like were the public, uh, intellectuals, the press itself? I think that um, they were the, the public. I'm not sure the public cared a great deal. Um, people like to think that the, there was this one area of great, uh, of keen interest to the public. But um, Time Incorporated spent a lot of money on this project, including on getting the word out, getting the report out at the end and collecting news clippings from around the country. It got a lot of news coverage. And uh, the Time Inc. memo I read said we got almost no letters at all. Like the, the report itself, the body of it was published in Fortune magazine. Almost nobody wrote in. It hmm. seemed that the public didn't care that much about this. Um, intellectuals, I think, hadn't given the press a lot of thought. There was a bit more um, press criticism from the social sciences coming out around that time, um, including Leo Rostin. And there were press critics like uh, George Seldes who'd written about some of these things. But none of them, I think, had been as systematic as the Hutchins Commission was. And uh, none of them made the splash of, uh, of these 13 leading American intellectuals coming up with a, a statement as they did. Did it matter that it was happening at this point? You know, when we think of the 40s, I think a lot of people will immediately think those early 40s and associate with World War II. Does, does World War II or, or anything else in that context of the 1940s lead this commission to, you know, look at things in a certain way or gravitate toward particular conclusions that maybe had it occurred 10 years earlier, 10 years later, they wouldn't have been as focused on? Well, on the one hand, they didn't talk much about the war. And I think that was a good instinct on their part that uh, uh, the, the report was criticized at the time for not having a lot of specifics. But looking back at it this much later, the specifics are the least interesting thing when they talk about what who who bought the the, the blue network or something. It's not that interesting now. What's interesting are these sort of uh, timeless principles. 
Um, what surprised me, especially when I read the deliberations, was the extent to which they were operating under circumstances that are kind of similar to ours. Uh, they talked about fearing that democracy was doomed. Uh, some of this uh, had been in the air during the 1930s, during the Depression, but there were still concerns, even during the war, that uh, that people were really angry, uh, that especially racists and nativists might flock behind a demagogue. Uh, and they talked about how the media might be partly responsible for that. Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr said, if the press hadn't uh, turned Charles Lindbergh into such a hero in the 1920s, he wouldn't have become such a menace uh, around 1940 when he was opposing uh, U.S. involvement in the war. And you can think of that with the star of The Apprentice now, how the media may make a demagogue. Uh, they talked about partisan media uh, leading to polarization and information bubbles, at the same kinds of things we see uh, now. Um, uh, William Ernest Talking, who was a philosopher on the commission, said one of the troubles with a partisan news outlet is that it may make a lot of money, but it becomes a prisoner of its own success. And he said, a, a newspaper that goes purely partisan can't turn back. It becomes, it, it becomes obliged to its audience not to depart from the party line. Uh, if it does, it's going to lose audience. And I think we've seen that with uh, Fox News losing audience to some of the more strident competitors. Um, they talked about uh, private censorship, about uh, uh, boycotts, blacklisting, uh, what, what are now being called de uh, deplatforming, cancel culture. They worried about anonymous speakers uh, of the sort that people now talk about trolls on social media. They, they were worried about people not trusting the press anymore and the danger that people might even reach a point where they don't trust their own ability to know what's going on, to understand the truth, in which case they might sort of just back off and watch uh, as democratic institutions were dismantled. And what and, did they recommend? And it was sorry to interrupt. What, what, what do they recommend as a remedy to that situation? Well, what they recommended was try. they were against partisan uh, journalism. They thought that that was a, a terrible mistake. They wanted a greater diversity of opinion in the press. They wanted more different voices, more different ideas. But they had an idea of objectivity, really, and, uh, and a hope that the press across the country could kind of tell the same story in terms of facts and not be biased one way or another politically. Um, but they did want this diversity of, of opinion. They were concerned in talking about the press throughout about unaccountable giant power, economic power, the power to influence people. Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, one of the members, said that if corporations have the power to suppress certain ideas and they use it, then democracy is doomed. So the commission tried to find ways to argue that the corporate media needed to feel a, a responsibility to the democratic system and publish ideas that were perhaps not shared by their own uh, publishers and editors. So what was the reception to all of this, right? You know, if the commission is saying, OK, in our opinion, press, you've got to get it together, right? Like if you, you have this uh, role in a democracy to, to fulfill, was that call heeded? Um, what, what was the response of the press, um, both in terms of what they were saying and in terms of their actions to this report? The, the press, like most of us, probably didn't love being criticized. And many daily newspapers uh, responded harshly to the report, especially uh, the conservative uh, press, like the Chicago Tribune. Um, some of them were virtually hysterical. Um, the, uh, the Chicago Tribune's headline referred to a free press Hitler style, as though what the commission were recommending was a sort of totalitarianism. <laughs> um, the, the impact at the time was a lot of bad publicity in the daily press, um, a fair amount of bad publicity among journalism uh, professors because their report uh, was disrespectful toward them as a part of uh, Robert Maynard Hutchins's preference for a liberal arts curriculum rather than uh, coursework in skills. Um, and then uh, some of the members said within a year or two, it seemed to have been forgotten. Uh, 
But it was revived uh, in the late 1950s uh, in four theories of the press, one of the theories being social responsibility, which was based on the Hutchins Commission. And it became part of the, the journalism school canon in the years since. I think it's, it's more helpful in clarifying uh, the context, the framework of the press and democracy, even if it's, uh, its direct impact on the press is a little harder to figure out. In a way, it, it helps us understand how to think about the press and how to think about issues like uh, giant economic power in the press that are, that are as important today as ever. Um, the press has gotten more like uh, what they would um, respect and appreciate in some ways, and it is probably uh, the problems are deeper in some other ways. I, and and you've just gotten exactly to one of the main questions I want to make sure that we address before we run out of time, which is, you know, the 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 release of the uh, the commission's report will celebrate its 75th year anniversary in 2022. That's just around the corner. What are some of the areas where you see the things the commission was talking about 75, 74 years ago um, having the most impact on what we're seeing today in our current press environment? Well, uh, socially, I think there are the uh, issues they touched on, like information bubbles, uh, the rage uh, of the public. Um, uh, Hawking said that a, a partisan news outlet makes money by p making people angry, by telling them whom to hate. Uh, the deplatforming demagogues, a sort of post-truth uh, culture that remain with us because of two things, uh, one of which they were familiar with, which is partisan news. Uh, now we have partisan cable news. And then the other would have totally baffled them, which is social media. Um, on the one hand, it's, it's unfiltered. There are no elites. It's, it's a common carrier. It really lets everyone express opinions in a way they would have liked. Um, but it, it, there's no filter at all. I think they wanted better filters, not uh, the removal of filters. And social media also encouraged sort of unreflective, I think, uh, anger and rage. Uh, Hawking talked about how we need a liberty of the garden instead of liberty of the weeds. But then the biggest issue with social media is just giant, unaccountable economic power. The, uh, Facebook, Twitter, or Google are much larger than the Chicago Tribune or Time Inc., the companies that, whose, whose economic power in the 1940s seemed to threat to democracy. Well, so you have uh, you've put so much work into understanding this this commission and its findings in your career, and so I'm really interested to hear um, your response to this this last question that we ask all of our guests, which is why journalism history matters. I think the in a way it matters because the because the past matters in general. Um, the past is a way of understanding ourselves and how we got here. And journalism history is an important data point uh, in understanding the past. Uh, journalism itself is, is in part the mirror in which we see and try to understand ourselves. And the Hutchins Commission thought there might be a way to wipe away some of the smudges and help that mirror uh, provide a little bit better of an image. Absolutely. Well, Stephen, I want to thank you one more time for being on the show. It's been uh, fantastic talking with you, and I feel like I understand this report a little bit better. So I, I, I thank you for that. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks very much. That's it for this episode. Thanks for tuning in, and be sure to subscribe to our podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter at jhistoryjournal. That's all one word. Until next time, I'm your host, Ken Ward, signing off with the words of Edward R. Murrow. Good night and good luck. Good luck.